it's time to take a look at Times Pat and see if we've learned anything from them. Our guide this week is Tommy Graham from History Ireland. And today, Tommy, we're looking at the history of Irish show bands. Uh, I'm happy to report it was a bit before my time, but they were quite the phenomenon. Yes, Tara. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering how many of our listeners are familiar with this uh, genre. Uh, but it really is, it's quite spectacular. I mean, in a scale, uh, also in how specific to Ireland it was but I think to understand it we need to, to set the scene and, and you know first of all consider what was it about the 1960s in particular that made it different you know from the previous uh, decade we, we think about the 50s as characterised by mass emigration economic failure etc and really the 1961 census seemed to confirm that I mean it, it seemed to confirm that we had a debt wish you know mm. I mean the population had been in continuous cli- decline since uh, the famine essentially we were down to what about 200 and 2,800,000 2, people in 1961. Now, by 1971, that's up to nearly 3 million people. Uh, so we go from the lowest population after independence to the highest population right. after independence in one decade. And That's some baby boom. No, that it's, well, it's a start of it. Uh, we normally think the baby boom was post-1945 in Europe and the United States. Our baby boom came 15, 20 years later. So our birth rate actually peaked about 1980. But this is the beginning of it. Mm. And what on, what, may, what was different about this was, I think basically it's the, it's the lamas Whitaker economic plan. Uh, you know, uh, Lamas becomes Taoiseach, uh, replaces Dev in 1959. And this is the, the, the strategy of attracting foreign direct investment, etc. And I think, you know, any change in economic plan would have produced results because things were so bad you know right. it, like if it, it had done anything that, that's this is what most economists say but uh, you know but the, the 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 fruits of this were pretty pretty good initially you know good uh, um growth rates etc but also it meant more migration to to urban areas so more people are moving from the countryside to the towns and that obviously immediately has an effect in terms of social control you know some other one looking over your shoulder etc etc you know you're you're much freer in the city and if they were moving from rural areas to townlands then there was probably because of employment and they probably had a few more bob in their pockets that's it that's it you see um we're talking here about teenagers and uh, Teenagers are a spending subsection of society. I know all about that. I have three of them, <laughs> right? But the point is, there has to be a critical mass of them about the place to, to develop this kind of youth market. So that began to take shape in Ireland. Um, so now the thing is, you, 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 we couldn't overstate the success of this because uh, less people are emigrating. So there's actually quite a bit of unemployment by the end of the decade, the end of the 60s. But the youth section of the of the society are not being as badly hit yeah. by that. So they're getting whatever jobs are out there. But you have other uh, factors like uh, um, free, free second level education came in uh, in the 60s. More people were beginning to go to university. Now, in a way, what's that, what that's doing is it's extending adolescence. Uh, I'm sure there's a few listeners there know all about this, right? We have 20 or even 30 or uh, something uh, offspring still in the house. But you know what I mean? So that idea of, you know, you're not expected to go out to work. Like. So the, the, the t- what, being a teenager, being that, you know, is, is, is a much more elongated uh, uh, phenomenon. So, uh, and then if you look at the extra people that there were around in 1971, uh, again, the, the, the 14 to 24, 24 year old cohort are overrepresented. And that was to continue. And I remember in the 1970s, the famous. Uh, statistic that was trotted out again and again half the population were under 15 at one stage uh, that's no longer the case so this was the beginning of that that uh, phenomenon now you things like you know television I mean people talk about the Late Late Show Gay Bourne RTE what people don't talk about I think far more significant or as significant is the radio not the old steam radio that's stuck on the corner that everybody has to listen to your transistor radio. Right. And I can distinctly remember my, my older brother, uh, Eugene, he, he went to boarding school, you know, in, in, in St. McCartan's in, in Monaghan. Like, it's like cold, it's actually. <laughs> I'm glad I never went there. But, you know, he used to tell me, you know, he'd be walking around with the, with the little transistor stuck in his ear and then he'd get a whack over the, you know, the back of the head. From, Listening from to priest. what on the radio, though? Oh, what? Radio Luxembourg, right. Radio Caroline, yeah. you know. And the other thing is, of course, we're not, you see, we, we, we are an English-speaking nation. So we can plug in directly into the whole Anglo-American culture, more so than a, a teenager in France or Germany or whatever. So really, and I think I think also it brings the idea of the, the universality or immediacy. I know John Waters uh, wrote about this, you know, he was from, you know, Roscommon, you know, small town. That idea that you're part of a wider culture 
you know, that you're part of the world. Yeah. You know, and you're tuning right into this. It's new. It's rebellious, you know, and you're yeah. part of it. Yeah. You know, so this is beginning to this begin to happen as well. Um, and so if you didn't have a telly and you didn't have a transistor radio, you needed to be entertained. And this is where the show band yes. phenomenon kind of kicked off. Yeah, the show band came in. Now, the show bands didn't drop out of the sky, right? You, you, I mean, at the centre of the show band phenomenon is dance. Now, you, when you, if I say dance culture to most listeners out there, they're thinking, oh, raves, yeah. ecstasy. And, you know, uh, for the last 20 years, that's what dance culture meant. You don't think of show bands when you think of raves, but I would suggest there is a continuity because one of the phenomena of the uh, the uh, the dance culture, the recent dance culture, were these ad hoc, you know, illegal raves. Uh-huh. You know, yeah. The, you know, yeah. Mobile yeah. phones, social networks, yeah. meeting a field somewhere. The thing about that, that's been going on for centuries in Ireland. I mean, what, what's dancing at the crossroads? What's the difference between dancing at the crossroads and raving at the crossroads? I mean, it's the same sort of idea bunch of young people, musicians, dance. Now, forgetting about the drugs here for a minute, if you talk to any uh, dance musician, they'll tell you that when people start dancing, they get into a trance-like state. I mean, I talk to traditional musicians, they like to play for dancers because kind of get into this trance-like state themselves. So it's not just about drugs, it's about the collective thing of people meeting together and also with the disapproval of their social betters. That's even better. That's even better than drugs, I'd say. You know, the idea you're meeting your friends, you're, you're having a good time and you're sort of bucking the, the system. But the thing is, and this raises a whole then moral panic that you get in the, the red tops, you know, about raves and drugs, blah, blah, blah. The same sort of moral panic would have been raised with dancing back in the day, right? Uh, because as the fellow said, you know, dancing is, what is it? It's a, it's a vertical pursuit, uh, you know, that sublimates a, a horizontal desire. But uh, sure, allegedly. they've been coming off of the, that, the, the show bands would have been coming out on the back of like the ballroom of romance era. Yeah, well, this is the thing. So, so the thing is that they, 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 that parents knew what they were getting up to in the old dance halls oh, and so oh, that's why they were worried when these show bands arrived is, in well, town. Well, there were attempts to clamp down on it. I mean, there were attempts to clamp down on everything in Ireland. Uh, you know, people talk about you know, the influence of the Catholic Church, etc., etc., you know, down with jazz, you know. But the interesting thing about all these things is one wonders how successful were they at clamping down on it. I mean, if Catholic bishops were going on and on about the immorality of dance halls, that must mean because people were going to them, yeah. you know. But the thing is that that the the uh, Public Dance Hall Act was passed in 1935, and that's the that's the legal template for the show band system. The idea was to bring it indoors, control it, yeah. police it, right? Uh, no drink, uh, and then in the 50s, then and into the 60s, these huge cavern-like ballrooms were built, often in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And they'd pack in thousands of people, not hundreds, thousands of people in some cases. Uh, I mean, my, the one I remember uh, is the Astoria Ballroom in, in uh, Bundorn. I'm, I'm originally from Ballyshannon. Now, I'd left I'd left the town by the time I was a teenager, but I remember the Astoria, you know. But it's very sad to go back there. It's now like an, a, an empty shell, a concrete shell, fell foul of the, the Celtic Tiger. Like they knocked it, they half knocked it down, they never rebuilt it, you know. Right. But I'm just saying that that was typical of a whole plethora of these huge uh, dance halls. Now, so what you originally would have had was jazz orchestras, as they were called, sitting down, you know, uh, and then somebody and there's the jury, the jury is still out as to who decided to stand up. You know, it's, somebody said, right, right, well, let's get get away, get away from this kind of funny little yoke in front of me, you know, the bandstand. Yeah. And we stand up and we start moving. Right. So uh, I've heard Clipper Carlton, you know, I, I've I've. I'm open to any listener out there to tell me who was the first jazz orchestra to stand up. Anyway, this happened in the 50s. And then the idea was you'd put on a show, hence the term show, show band. band. So included in that would be an element of comedy, a bit of knock around. You'd mix it then with uh, whatever the, the hits of the day were. But then the other thing that comes along is, and this is where, where uh, um, show bands come into their own, is they're all trying to tame Elvis. They're all trying to tame rock and roll. Yeah. Right? Now, there's nothing peculiar to Ireland about this. Everybody does this. In Britain, uh, you had Cliff Richard, back in the news at the moment, but let's not go there. Uh, Tommy Steele. These were all kind of cute, you know, respectable versions of Elvis. France had it as well. The guy, what's his name? Johnny Halliday, I think his name was. So everyone tried to do this. So this was an attempt to have a clean cut, respectable version uh, that would essentially give the kids the rock and roll they wanted. Now, they mix it in, of course, with other stuff, a bit of country and western, a bit of folk, traditional ballads or whatever, and a bit of comedy, 
your that was your show your show band. Who were the big hitters? Who were the big names? Well, Brendan Boyer, obviously, and, and of course he went on to have a big career in in Las Vegas. Uh, Joe Dolan. Now I, I tell you, I, I my first time I went abroad as a teenager was uh, an eighteen year old, nineteen seventy six. I was in France, right, and I was absolutely amazed. You know, uh, jukebox Joe Dolan on the on the on the, <laughs> and, I, and everyone said, oh yeah, he's well known here. That was you know news to me. He was really big uh, in Europe. Um, the, the, the in terms of you know the, the show bands themselves, Clipper Carlton, the the, the the Royal, and like you know members of those bands would be big names in the day. And these guys were gigging literally up and down the country well, day in, day out. Yeah, it was worse than that though because you couldn't p- play one town and then go down the road and play the neighbouring town because you're, you're drawn from the same right, pool. Yeah. You had to drive to the other one end, end of the, the country. country. So these guys were on the road continually, you know. And, I, you know, I, I talked to a few of the, the old timers. We had a, one of our head schools last uh, summer in Bundoran on this. And they were saying, you know, that in terms of the, just the exhaustion, the drink, you know, it took its toll on people, you know, as well. You well, know. one more text saying, we went all over Ireland to see the show bands. No drugs, just a mineral. So the yeah. audience weren't drinking. Well, the, well, the, the lads were, presumably. Uh, that was the thing, you know, the lads would get tanked up in the, in, in the pub and then they'd arrive in at closing time and the, you know, the girls would be waiting for them. You know, one, the, the girls would be one side of the, the hall, the lads the other, allegedly. I, I, it's a little bit before my time, I have to say. <laughs> I, I, um, I, was, I, I spent my teenage years in Dublin, so I, I, I was spared the, 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 uh, the, the show band scene. But my older brothers would talk about it. And, you know, for my, my older brother, usually, like, he was big into the Beatles and all that, right? Like, he hated show bands in that sense. But that's who he went to listen to every week. Yeah. Like, his social outlet was show yeah. bands. Uh, but he remember he went to see the Kinks play in the Astoria. I mean, that was like some difference from uh, a show they, band. They were, they were char- chart-topping band at the time. But he said they couldn't play their instruments as well as the show bands, right? So the the show bands, you know, technically, musically, mm. brilliant. But they were just playing covers, and what he craved, you know, was was uh, originality. Original. But going back to big names, uh, another thing people might realise is the big names that made it in 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 mainstream rock. Van Morrison started off in a show band. Rory Gallagher started off in a show band. So these guys all uh, served their time uh, in these uh, in, in, in show bands, you know. New Spotlight magazine, which was the, the, the sort of the, the, the trade magazine, that sold 66,000 copies, you know, in 1967. I mean, that's amazing, you know. Yeah. Now, they, 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 of course, if you're my brother, what were the alternatives? Um, well, two alternatives, really. Uh, one were the beat bands uh, and the other were, were, were you know, the, the whole ballad trad boom. Now, the beat bands... These would be people playing, or, you know, groups playing, trying to play anyway, original music mixed in with a few covers. And this was mainly an urban phenomenon. So you'd, you'd beat clubs in Dublin, Cork, Limerick, Waterford, Kilkenny, Carlow, Dundalk. Uh, groups like, I don't know if any, uh, uh, any of our listeners remember them, The Creatures, Granny's Intentions, Skid Row. Uh, and, you know, they, they, they tended to adopt a kind of a mod style, long hair. And of course, uh, if you if listeners should check out the Rocky Road to Dublin. It's on DVD. This is a documentary made in 1967 and you can, it's a for sale in the Irish Film Institute. Well worth having a look at. But there's a scene there from this club in Dublin. 1967 this is and it looked very up to the mark. As my father used to say, you know, all the boys have long hair and all the girls have short hair. You know, that, that you know, that really up to the mark 60s look. So this idea that we were just some hick place you know, in the sticks. Not necessarily the case, right? But the thing is, the beat, the the the, the beat clubs, of course, they drew the 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 the, you know, the moral panic thing. You know, there were drugs being taken, and, mm. and of course, there weren't. I mean, the figures, you know, two were charged for drugs offences in 1965, one in 1966. You know, but the kind of music they were listening to. You know, it was the Rolling Stones, the Who, etc. You know, they'd be full of drug references. You know, and famously, uh, B. P. Fallon interviewed uh, Pete Townsend in 1966 for yeah. New Spotland, and Townsend was quite uh, forthright. He was saying, like, you know, uh, smoking a, a spliff or taking a pill would be like somebody having a pint of bitter. And B. P. Fallon, like, you know, who, 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 you know, would be the epitome of hip these days. Uh, thought twice about publishing it actually that he was concerned about you know promoting this drug culture etc this old BP you know back in 1966 you know? and so obviously I mean if these outside influences were filtering in you'd had you know an adult conservative population who would have been learning about all of this and hearing about all of this would they have had concerns then that this type of activity was being replicated when, when people went to see the show bands yeah obviously yeah but I mean the, 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 the real drink dangerous drink uh, dangerous drug rather was drink you know uh, and uh, you know but the, 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 and of course it, there was a whole change there as well the lounge bar women coming into lounge bars and so on you know 
you know, the shock civilization of as we as we knew it was coming to an end. No, the the thing was, yeah, the the, the thing is though that the show band scene, on the other hand, was pr- was projected as being safe. This was the the clean cut Hold version them. of this. I have to say, my, I'm I'm coming to the view though that you know we shouldn't overestimate the conservatism or whatever of say the 50s and even earlier you know I mean I was wondering people talk about repressed sexuality and so on like what about all the people having good sex you know what about all the people having a good time you know I mean if you were a teenager growing up in the 50s it probably was brilliant you know in, in Dublin you know you'd know, you probably have a, a morose tinted view of it you know so I suspect there are these you know counter conservative trends there all the time I mean you know that film uh, on James Gralton, you know, Jimmy's Hall, that's out. Uh, this, this, it's about this guy who set up a hall in Leitrim. Oh, I did yeah. see it. Yeah, anyway, yeah. It's, he was a left-wing kind of Republican guy, right? He, he eventually was... was uh, um, um, he was... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, he, had to, he had to leave the country, you know. But uh, the thing is, Luke Gibbons uh, theorises that, you know, that this represented, you know, a, a, a kind of a radical trend culturally. People liked their jazz. They didn't care what the bishop said, mm. you know. So similarly in the, in, in the, in the 1960s. Um, but the, 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 I mean, there's a great quote from a guard. There was some, uh, the Chosen Few, great name for a group. They were, they were found guilty of some minor transgression of the Dance Hall Act. But Gardy, in evidence, accused them of playing music uh, that that quote incited sex, rape, and indecency. You know, I mean, it's kind of a bit over the top. Now well, the other why, alternative. Why, yeah, sorry. Tell me, why did they come to an end though? Because I mean, you had this entire d- decade through the sixties, but but they did come to a rather abrupt end. It seems. Uh, well, it kind of petered out. Now I think that there was probably a complacency within the business itself that they they would go on forever because all they had to do was replicate whatever the the, the chart stuff was. You know, and they'd, like a chameleon, they'd keep uh, changing. But what happens is. Um, Increasingly, people are uh, uh, listening to radio, so they're listening to recorded music. Mm. So the, the bar then, the standard of recorded music goes up and up in the 60s. Unfortunately, the standard of recording in Ireland was very poor. So a lot of these show bands were quite good live. The recordings were crap. Right. You know, so they simply couldn't compete with the stuff that's coming over the radio or the record or whatever. But also, of course, your lounge bar, the point is your, your, your ballad scene, your trad scene, it's moving into the pub. Okay. And your beat bands are moving into pubs. So the point is, the lads are in the pub and they say, well, why, do we, why, why should why we, we wander down to this, this yeah. drafty hall? Yeah. You know, OK, so the women are down there, right? But, I mean, there's, you know, eventually there were women in the, in the lounge bar as well because women were coming into the bar. And then a lot of the, sh- the show band people shifted over into the cabaret scene in the 1970s. But I think what really figuratively, figuratively and literally brought it to an end was the Miami show band massacre, 1975. Because up to that time, the show band scene was an all-Ireland uh, all island, cross community, Catholic, Protestant, you know, yeah. and it was almost like they were in a bubble. They were immune from any, uh, uh, you know, grief from anybody. But, and they, they, you know, six years into the troubles, then bang, this this thing happens, and really that that knocks the, the knocks it on the head. Now there is a, a, a plus side to that, if you can say such a thing, in, in the wider musical industry, in that uh, promoters, you know, small scale local promoters, then found it, you know, student union, uh, entertainment officers found it almost impossible to book British rock bands in the they late 70s. They wouldn't come, they were afraid. Because, yeah, they're going, yeah. Yeah, they're going to get killed. So that opened up a space then for local talent and then, I mean, when I was around Dublin in the late 70s then you had a whole kind of punk new wave thing. Plus and the time just changed, the era changed, musical taste changed and outside influences probably became, you know, more people had tellies. Most yes. people probably had tellies by but that I, period I, in time. But I think what also happens is that young people themselves and the music business itself itself develops its own identity. In other words, people realise, you know you know what, we have our own music here. It's not just traditional. It can be a mixture of everything. Mm. I mean, take horse lips, combine the trad, yeah. beat band, show band. I mean, horse lips, you could argue, were just a, a, a show band with long hair and funny clothes, you know. Uh, you know, but they, and they, and they played the, the, the ballroom uh, circuit, yeah. interestingly. Are there any show bands still around the circuit? Uh, I think that they still play. Uh, um, uh, Brendan Boyer still, still he still plays in, in Las Vegas if you if, if you have the money to go over. Joe Dolan up you know. to his death a number um, of years ago. Dickie Rock still Rock, around. Yeah. And I saw Dickie Rock once in, in uh, Croke Park, some school thing. I was a um, charity thing. Absolutely brilliant, you know. And funny thing about Dickie Rock is a quote uh, I, I heard from him. He was very critical of the early show band scene, saying, oh, there's too much comedy and too much lag, not enough music, you know. And he's the guy that's kind of identified with it, you know. So, yeah. you know, great performer, you know. 
Tommy, where can people learn more? Oh, there's a couple of podcasts on the History Ireland website. We had this discussion in Bundorn that I referred to last year on the show band scene. Uh, there's also one on the beat band scene, which we w- will be repeating uh, at the Electric Picnic the weekend after next. There's a great website called irish-showbands.com, edited by a guy called Jerry Gallagher. There's a book by Jerry Smith called Noisy Island, A Short History of Popular Music, published in 2006. And that, that uh, DVD I recommended, Rocky Road to Dublin, by Peter Lennon. And we'll be podcasting it too, I'd say, should anyone want to listen back, newstalk.ie forward slash Moncrief. More details there.